Ontario New Democrats are saying that justice delayed is justice denied. This is an NDP press conference last week on the issue that News Ledger will follow up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen Wong Tam. I'm the member of Provincial Parliament for Toronto Centre. I'm also the official opposition critic for the Ministry of the Attorney General. Under this Conservative government, every aspect of Ontario's justice system is in shambles. Access to justice is routinely denied. The backlog is staggering. 53,000 cases gathered dust at the Landlord-Tenant Board. Civil cases now take five years to get to trial, and the Ontario courts rank dead last in wait times nationwide. The Conservatives play a reckless game of politics with justice, appointing unqualified cronies, including a U.S. paid gun lobbyist to select our next round of judges. Delays and denials of justice ruin lives. Criminals walk free and the innocent suffer behind bars. Last year alone, 82% of Ontario's incarcerated were waiting for trial, a broken system that affects literally everyone. This isn't just about funding, it is important, but it's also about priorities. This government's budget ignores the crisis that is unfolding in our court system. Tough on crime rhetoric from the government means absolutely nothing if the courts are understaffed and cases are tossed out. Right now in Ontario, courtrooms sit empty while lives hang in limbo. Staff are overwhelmed and justice is again denied. The Premier is profoundly harming our justice system and most recently reports of human traffickers, gun-involved criminals, impaired drivers, rapists, abusers have walked free because their cases were thrown out. Thrown out not because they proved their innocence, but because their cases took too long to schedule and complete. The government released their budget two days ago. I was desperately hopeful, as we were, all were, that they would include new adequate funding for the courts. It did not. Court backlogs were not mentioned once. Bail was not when mentioned once. Pre-trial detention was not mentioned once. But let's not all dwell on the countless ways that the Conservatives have failed Ontarians. Today, we're putting faces forward to show the human costs of their neglect. I am incredibly privileged to stand with two extraordinary women, Kate Alexander and Emily Agar, victims of Doug Ford's government's underinvestment and understaffing of the court system. Along with them, we will hear from Kate's lawyer, Robert Rotenberg. The violent crimes they've endured are heartbreaking. The horrific delays and ordeals in the court system re-victimizing Kate and Emily are maddening and a shameful, shameful stain on Ontario courts. In their own words, I first welcome Kate Alexander. Good morning. My name is Kate Alexander. A restraining order. That is the only resolution the Canadian justice system could muster for my attempted murder by my ex-boyfriend in Leaside on July 31st, 2021. Twice, criminal trial was scheduled. Twice, it was cancelled under Chapter 11B of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This means an extremely violent abuser is free without a single consequence. Chapter 11B is a law requiring provincial cases to be tried within 18 months and federal cases within 30 months. But that means that cases can be tossed no matter what the crime is. Whilst I agree with the need for efficacy in the court, that should not outweigh the need for justice and safety. I was told my attempted murder is not a priority. And despite having a new billion dollar courthouse, the government has not allocated the funds to staff it properly. I am not an anomaly, not the only one who has suffered a continuation of abuses in the hands of the system that is supposed to protect us. The government, the ministers, the judges, the Crown attorneys have, left our community, have let our community down in life-threatening ways. They have created an extension of the hashtag MeToo movement, 
hashtag no time for justice. I have now spoken with countless women who have had their debilitating gender-based violence cases either thrown out or resolved with a peace bond. Pedophiles are also free under this law. The current system sides with the criminal regardless of how horrific their offense is, no matter how much evidence is against them. Canadians need to be aware that Chapter 11B in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of Charter of Rights and Freedoms and that justice is not being served. I am lucky that he didn't kill me that night. My story has already garnered international attention and the governments of Ontario and Canada are being scrutinized for their abhorrent lack of action. These governments are not tough on crime. I am a survivor of domestic violence and a victim of the Canadian justice system. The system needs immediate reform. Canadians are not safe when the laws only impact the victim. Thank you. I will pass it on to my incredible lawyer, Mr. Robert Rotenberg. Hi, it's Robert Rotenberg here. I have the honor to be Kate's uh, lawyer. Uh, as many of you know, today is the opening of the baseball season. I'm a big baseball fan, and baseball had the same problem that the justice system had. The games took too long. So what happened? The commissioner finally laid down the law and brought in the pitch clock. Strict rules of the exact timing that had to be for the pitcher, for the batter. And it worked. It worked because every stadium has the proper stopwatch, has the proper equipment. Supreme Court of Canada did the exact same thing. I've been a criminal lawyer for more than 30 years, and for years we had all these delays. The problem isn't that people, the problem isn't, excuse me, the main thing is people need trials within a reasonable time, but it's not just the people, it's also the victims. The whole system needs to work that way. So that's why we have the Jordan Law. The problem is, think of the baseball stadiums. They all have the proper equipment. The courthouses don't. So cases are being tossed, not for the valid reasons, but simply because there is not enough equipment, there's not enough courthouses. You're going to hear Emily's story. It's horrifying. So the problem is not that we have limits. The problem is we haven't come up. We haven't brought in the stopwatches. We haven't supplied what is needed. As Kristen said, the government has a new budget and there's not a word about the justice system. Very quickly, people, I think, th I think the governments are afraid to invest in the justice system because it's only about bad people. But it's not about bad people. It's about everyone. It's about jurors. It's about the people who work in the system. And mostly, as you can see, it's about common citizens who need their day in court and they're deprived of it because we have not properly funded the justice system. Thanks. Hello, my name is Emily Egger. I was raped 789 days ago. The Jordan decision set a precedent that allowed for a maximum of 540 days for this rapist to have his trial heard and ruled upon. It has now been 170, sorry, 147 days since the charges were stayed due to his right to a speedy trial. Back in November, I was reassured that this problem had been fixed and that other survivors would not have to experience the heartbreaking and soul-crushing reality that is mine. But alas, I am here with my dear friend Kate, who, if things were properly fixed, never should have had to stand beside me and wear this title. This goes beyond us. We know that there are other victims of this broken legal system who, like us, will live with this pain forever. Enough is enough. Stop the excuses and make real change. If appropriate resources are not allocated to assure that Jordan timelines are never reached, dethrone the Jordan decision. R versus Jordan was based on drug charges. It should never have been applied 
to cases regarding sexual assault and domestic violence. The men who committed these horrific crimes now walk free while both Kate and I were given life sentences. Thank you. Y you know, I knew that today was going to be tough because the stories are heartbreaking. I, I am just so incredibly moved by the courage that, that Kate and Emily bring with them as they continue to demand justice. So thank you. Thank you to, to, to you both for being here. And thank you to you for also speaking for survivors who are not here. Uh, thank you to Robert for your incredible advocacy for, for Kate. Um, victims of crime and all Ontarians demand urgent action from the Ford government to confront the court delays. Survivors demand respect. They need the support. And we, we have to clear the backlogs as soon as possible. There is a chance for the government to do that. The tool is called the budget. They don't have to be silent on it and allow Kate and Emily to do their work for them by speaking up when they don't. It's time for tangible solutions, not hollow assurances. Ontarians deserve better. We welcome questions from the media now. Uh, Mr. Rotenberg, um, we've heard that this is happening, uh, and we've heard that this is it's that it's to blame for underfunding or understaffing. But can you give us an idea of how exactly these cases end up being delayed and delayed and delayed? Like, what exactly is happening in the courtroom? that causes this to keep getting kicked, uh, cases like this to get kicked down the road? Well, remember, I'm a defense lawyer, mm -hmm. so I split my practice between representing victims and also representing accused. Um, and as I said, I've been a lawyer for more than 30 years, and I think Kristen put it very succinctly. I mean, for years we would have clients just sitting in jails or, or waiting and waiting for trials. And people forget that when a trial is delayed, it's not just unfair to the, um, to the defendant. It's unfair to the witnesses. It's unfair to the victim. It's even unfair to the Crown attorneys. You can't have a good trial four or five years later. Memories fade. So the Jordan decision was welcomed by everyone because we spent years litigating this foolish litigation. Well, it was 25 months. Was somebody really uh, prejudiced by this? It was ridiculous. So the Jordan decision is the right idea. That's why I brought the baseball analogy. It's a good thing to bring in the, s in, in the pitch clock, but if half the stadiums don't have the proper equipment, then people are driving and coming to watch uh, Guerrero play, and there's no game. And that's what's happened. In Emily's case, it's, it's astounding. The trial actually started. The trial started. She testified. Then she's told, come back in July. Is that right? I was there in July. It said, come back in November. Come back in November. And then she gets a phone call a few weeks, a few weeks uh, before that saying, oh, by the way, the case is gone. case has been withdrawn. Good luck. Same thing happened with Kate. Now, in a lot of European companies, countries, in a lot of European countries, there is a whole system set up for victims. So victims actually have their own advocates. They actually have lawyers assigned to them, which is a great system because right now, as Kate's lawyer, I'm just kind of on the outside. Also, we've done a lot of research. If you look at the victim services in other countries, it's astounding how excellent they are. Some of them have five, six, seven different categories. Now, I've heard from senior crowns in Toronto that the victim service people who work here, they're underpaid, they're understaffed, and they're overworked. So these are the frontline people made to assist, made to assist people like Kate and Emily, and that's their situation. Let me be clear. I'm not here to criticize the judges or the crowns or the defense lawyers. In fact, I work every day with judges and crowns. We all work incredibly hard to make the system work. 
The critique is not of that. The critique is that we're not funding the system properly. You know, years and years ago, when I was at law school, my mentor, Eddie Greenspan, uh, was lecturing us one day, and someone put their hand up and said, well, Mr. Greenspan, well, what, the government can't, can't afford that. And I've quoted Eddie a thousand times saying, he said, well, let them build one less bridge. This is people's justice. I've always remembered that. And in fact, if you looked at the percentage that the justice system is of the complete, of the total federal and provincial government, I believe it's something like 1% or 2%. Yeah, fraction. It's a fraction. Yeah. It's a fraction. So here we're taking people's liberty, the liberty of the accused, the liberty of the victims, even for jurors, everyone, and we're underfunding it for no good reason. You know, this new courthouse that we have today, I had an article in the Toronto Star 20 years ago about how desperately horrible the court system is. The court, sorry, the, the courts were. In Milton, the court is full of um, problems. They were supposed to redo the court, and they just said, well, we don't have the budget for it. They canceled it. How can you cancel creating a new courthouse for the fastest growing region, region in the whole, whole province. Anyhow, I like to give a little, I'm giving a bit of a speech. Um, yeah. I, I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. but I'm just trying to get a grasp on what the actual, like, what is actually causing this. You said, like, Emily's uh, um, trial was uh, moved to November from June. What was the reason given? I'm just trying to understand exact, like, the, exactly what is happening. The reason given was that a courthouse wasn't available. Is that right? Courtroom, courtroom wasn't available. No space. no space. No space. Not enough judges. Not enough court clerks. Yeah. To run a court, it, court you need court reporters. You need all these people. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the first day that trial was uh, set to begin, um, there were two courtrooms open in the entire courthouse. Um, so it was continuations of trials from a different day. And so they said, Emily, we don't have a room for you today. Come back again tomorrow. And when I came back again the following day, there was one courtroom in the entire courthouse open. And they had told me it was due to staffing concerns. On the third day, there was finally a room for us. And so um, I testified and was cross-examined, and then they, the judge said that he wanted to hear the rest of the trial out, but the next available dates were in November, which pushed us way out of the Jordan time frame. And that's why it was dropped? Yes. Okay. Um, we've seen compensation for uh, uh, bad justice or misjustice in the past. Is there compensation for the victims? that and are you taking that uh, ground uh, that compensation for victims that uh, get denied justice just as uh, defendants can I answer that yeah one sec that's an excellent question because there is a victim surcharge that people pay and there's a fund for victims which I think the maximum is about fifteen thousand dollars but that only applies if there's been a conviction but if you're a witness, if you're a victim, and the case is tossed out, so there's no conviction, so you don't, you don't even, uh, you don't even have the opportunity to apply for fairly meager victims' compensation. Yeah. But, but so, in other words, victim surcharges and victim compensation. Yes. Um, can you are you uh, can you take legal action to get court system for not being able to hear trial? Well, they're they're stuck in the civil courts, but. Even that fund for victims, te technically, these two women in the court system are not victims because there was no conviction found. Even like, in the eyes of the civil court. I'm not a civil lawyer. I'm just talking about the criminal court, the criminal compensation board. And I believe yeah, that there's... It's been scrapped. Yeah, has it? Yeah. The, the, yeah the, okay. No, it's, it's okay. Um, and I want to make sure that Kate gets yeah. in here because she had something to say about this. Um, the the provincial government has scrapped the criminal uh, injuries compensation board uh, and that system worked fairly well it provided quite a bit of support for survivors uh, and they were able to access up to thirty thousand dollars of support uh, that has all been scrapped and replaced and then defunded and shrunk uh, and replaced with something that doesn't work the the quick the 
the Victim Quick Response Program Plus. Um, and, uh, and if you have access to other services, you don't qualify. Uh, and the amount that you do actually have access to is meager compared to what your actual needs are. So all the governments bluster about how they're actually supporting survivors and every time they don on a purple scarf to show that they are supporting the end to gender-based violence, it is absolute hogwash and nonsense because survivors across Ontario are struggling to see more funding and also funding that actually reaches them and right now it doesn't. Okay. Go ahead. I asked specifically about this to the Crown Attorneys and Victim Services and they said it is at their discretion and there was a very nominal $500 fee for my peace bond for my attempted murder. $500 is significantly less than my day rate and it, <laughs> frankly with the number of days that I have missed uh, and work because of Zoom after Zoom, I live in Los Angeles now, but because after Zoom after Zoom after Zoom of whatever nonsense they wanted to to come up with that month, um, I missed a lot of work. I was, you know, put in a situation where I was constantly re-triggered by either victim services or by the Crown attorneys, simply when they weren't even doing their jobs. And so that $500 does not account for three, two and a half years of missed work opportunities, mental health services to, you know, recover from an attempted murder, recover from a rape, you know, therapists are what, $200 an hour? So it, there, it's, it's absolutely abhorrent. And there, again, it's, it's a funding issue, but it's also a decision. And it is a, there, I have seen it and I've spoken to many ministers, I've spoken to the mayor's office, and I have received the placating responses that are far too common of, oh, well, we're doing something about gender-based violence, but when it actually occurs, nothing is being done. California, I'm, you're from California, famous case came out of California, and this is what I'm kind of asking, is there a civil responsibility? I mean, in America, there's uh, one of my friends just received 80 million US dollars for PTSD suffering. I will be lucky to maybe get 250 Canadian dollars because there are caps within the civil system on uh, punitive damages, I believe. I'm, don't qu quote me on that, but it's also on pain and suffering. There are civil caps on what a victim can receive. So no, I can't, there's a ceiling. I am stuck in another ceiling of I cannot get more regardless of what happened to me. Do you think you have a case to sue the courts for screwing I've up? considered this. It has been, I've reached out to many lawyers and it has, they are extremely protected under the Crown Attorneys Act of 2019. And I mean, there have been two responses to that, but that is at a significant cost, $15,000 retainer fees. My, I retained a private lawyer already when I'm a victim of a crime. My family should not have to do that. We've already suffered enough. So yes, you could potentially sue the Crown Attorneys, but it, there's a precedence that it, that is a very unlikely, um, unlikely a favorable result for the victim. They are so protected and therefore not held accountable. In terms of the, um, the staffing shortages, what are we talking about in terms of what's needed? Like how how many staff are needed and yeah. what what does that mean equate in terms of dollars? So this, it's an excellent question. Um, OPSU, which is uh, the union that represents the majority of the court workers, have been flagging for years for the government that they are running into trouble uh, with respect to the adequate number of staff in the courts to make the system run smoothly. The justices have raised this problem, as well as trial lawyers. Everyone has put up their hand, rung the bell, s raised the sirens, and told the government that they've got to address this. The actual quantum will probably be the the numbers of people to fix the, pro the whole problem um, will require everyone sitting down to work together. Not one group has the full solution, but I can tell you right now that if you walk into the new billion dollar courthouse in downtown Toronto, it's empty. Those courtrooms are dark and it's because they cannot get people there. So any time that the Attorney General and the Premier talk about getting tough on crime, they are dumb on crime. They haven't done anything to support survivors and victims of crime in Ontario. And so I want to see everyone working together and, and it's become very frustrating because everybody is stuck in the system. No one is able to get any further because of the lack of funding 
but also specifically, we need to see the government just reset the clock by bringing us all together. And, uh, and they have the power to do it. The 2024 budget is before us. And as I mentioned, there's not, the solutions aren't there. Okay. Very quickly. Yeah. This was the car crash that anyone who worked in the justice system saw coming for years. I would talk to court clerks and they would complain about how they were so terribly underpaid. I talked to crowns, talked about how overworked they are. I talked to judges, the exact same thing. In the civil courts, people are waiting two, three years for family law cases. Uh, it's just, a, it's, it's justice delayed is justice denied. Justice denied is unjust. It's as simple as that. We all knew this was coming. And then the car crash was Jordan. The car crash was Jordan, which is just like the commissioner of baseball saying enough is enough. The Supreme Court quite rightly said enough is enough. And that's why we're where we are now. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, yeah. yeah. Want to do a quick like what you see? Subscribe. Hit the like button. And make sure to hit the notifications.